That's for sure. Never have to close the door. Been a long time, a year before. And I'm missing you so bad. Hi guys, welcome back to Exmo Lex. Today we are continuing to read this god-awful book. If you haven't seen the first three parts, I recommend you go watch them first. I will leave links in the description. But why is it so important to read such a horrible book, you might be asking yourself? Well, I think it's really important to see what the Mormon narrative was like just before the priesthood ban was lifted. And it's interesting to see how somebody deeply involved in the church can do the mental gymnastics to try to make the racism not be racist anymore. So let's see how much of this we can crank out in today's episode. Those who think that the not being allowed the priesthood and its attendant blessings in this mortal state is due to racial prejudice might consider the fact that there have been millions of people live and die upon this earth who likewise have not had the privilege of bearing the priesthood here regardless of what the color of their skin was. For centuries, the priesthood was not upon the earth except as possessed perhaps by a few key servants of God. Okay, this is a really stupid argument because if you believe that the priesthood is a literal thing, then you recognize that nobody had it. It wasn't being denied to anybody. It just wasn't here. It didn't exist. Like, oh, they didn't have it either. It didn't exist then. Now you are denying it to people because of the color of their skin. It's very different. I don't understand how you think that that's not different. The critics should note too that there are hundreds of millions of people upon the earth today who do not enjoy the privilege of even belonging to the church to say nothing of the priesthood, for they have never heard of it. While there are many, here in the United States and elsewhere who have had the opportunity to join the church. This is further evidence of the fallacy of the racial prejudice accusation. Again, those people don't not have the priesthood because of the color of their skin. They don't have it because they're not church members. But if all of those people were to join the church, guess who would get the priesthood? and who wouldn't? For that matter, if the critic or the apologizer is going to feign indignation about the not being allowed to bear the priesthood, why should he not feel more indignant about women not having the priesthood conferred upon them? Is this sex prejudice? <laughs> Now you're starting to get it, John. The church says that women sealed in celestial marriage enjoy the blessing that's of the priesthood in connection with their husbands, but they do not hold the priesthood. And there are thousands of LDS women who do not have the opportunity of entering the celestial marriage and thus of directly sharing the benefits of the priesthood. Is this an injustice of God to them in denying them the priesthood? And that's it, that's the whole, that's the whole chapter. So literally this page, and this little paragraph here, chapter nine, that was the entire chapter. And that whole chapter, the whole argument of the chapter was, well, people back before the priesthood existed didn't have the priesthood. And today, people who aren't members of the church don't have the priesthood, and women don't have the priesthood. Therefore, this priesthood ban is not racist. In scripture, we read quite a number of instances of God's placing a curse or mark upon a certain person or people because of their misconduct and disobedience to his laws. The curse usually involves not only that particular person or generation of people, but their posterity as well. One example is the Jews, cursed to become a hiss and a byword. Another is the Lamanites, whose skin was turned dark, and that of their children after them. Would it be justice on the part of God to just haphazardly or arbitrarily assign certain spirits to be born into these families or nations just for the sake of carrying out his curse upon the guilty party? Or would he assign those souls whose performance in the spirit world warrants such a circumstance of birth, which is in keeping with God's attribute of justice, which is reasonable. It's not, nothing of it's reasonable. Again, uh, if you didn't watch the last part or the last parts of this series, I suggest you go back and watch them. He talks about how the reason that black people are born with dark skin is because they were less valiant in the pre-existence. And because of that, lack of valiance, they are not allowed to have the priesthood today. And then he goes over how he believes that God is being merciful and justice is being served, basically. It's wild. Think of the millions of spirits born into the Lamanite race after the Lamanites had become a fallen people. How can you justify such an unfortunate circumstance of birth except on the basis of individual performance in the pre-mortal life? How can you justify it? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's just random. Maybe there isn't a God who is deciding that certain people were better before they were born. We believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression, declared the prophet Joseph Smith. And so it is with the, there were those in the spirit world whose performance caused them to forfeit the right to bear the priesthood of God and to enjoy its attendant blessings in this world. It took him like eight chapters to finally say the quiet part out loud. What he is saying here and what other apostles and general authorities in the church have said and taught around this same time period and before was that black people are born with dark skin because they were not good and they sinned in the pre-existence. And because of that sin, 
they are not worthy to have the priesthood here on earth which is again where it is super super racist and to claim that like well people before the priesthood was on the earth didn't have the priesthood why is that was it because they were all they sinned in the pre-existence because you don't teach that and what about women do women not have the priesthood because they sinned in the pre-existence you don't teach that you only teach that about black people you are singling somebody out because of the color of their skin and he doesn't see that being a bad thing at all so I've looked over this next chapter um, and it's mostly scripture so I don't want to sit and read through all of it but he talks about the story of Cain and how Cain was cursed and how he was the bad guy. Then he also talks about Egyptus and then about Father Abraham chronicling the genealogy of the, the Egyptians. He talks about the Pharaoh who also had the curse but was a good man and then he goes on to say note that Pharaoh was a good man just as Dr. George Washington Carver and many others of blood have been and are good men. Note too that Ham and his posterity through the mercy of God were blessed with the blessings of the earth and with the blessings of wisdom, although de denied the right of the priesthood. Among the people, as indeed among all the races of the earth, there is infinite variety and degree of circumstances of birth, of goodness, of opportunity, and lack of it. There are born into families of wealth and refinement, others who are blessed with great talents, and there are those who are born into the lowest classes of society in Africa, in squalor and ignorance, living out their lives in a fashion akin to that of the animals. And this man claims to not be racist at all. Does not this infinite variety of circumstance give further evidence of man's being assigned to that station in life which he has merited by his performance in the pre-mortal existence? Note also that part of Cain's curse was to have his posterity, those spirits, unable to bear the priesthood in this life. In view of the importance that humans rightly attach to their children, their posterity, what greater curse could come upon Cain as pertaining to this life? And what could have been more appropriate than for these spirits to have such a man as Cain as their progenitor? To suppose that the... The descendants of Cain are born with black skins and are denied the priesthood merely to perpetuate God's curse upon Cain is like an affront to reasoning man and to the justice and mercy of God. In the above scripture from Abraham, then, we have a reliable account of the early, early genealogy of the race, and in Abraham's comments, we have further evidence of the divine direction and the LDS church policy of not allowing the, the seed of Cain and Ham to bear the priesthood. Like he stated um, in the last chapter, we believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. When we learn about that scripture in seminary or in church, we're taught that we are only punished for our own sins, not for the sins of our fathers. So yes, if you believed that everybody who was a descendant of Cain was cursed just because of Cain, that wouldn't make sense with the scriptures and it also of course would not be fair. So he kind of wants to like lump these doctrines together and say, okay, so Cain and all of his prosperity, all of his children and his children's children forever have been cursed, but it's not just because of Cain. It's because they were not good in the pre-existence. It doesn't say that here. It says that Cain was cursed and therefore his children and family were cursed. It doesn't mention anything about the pre-existence. This is Mormons, again, like trying to make their own doctrine fit and make it make sense be like oh we believe that black people were less valiant in the pre-existence and so they're set down to this earth with dark skin so Cain had dark skin and he got cursed so it's the same they Cain wasn't valiant in the pre-existence and neither were his family members once again Mormons win the gold in the mental gymnastics this divinely directed policy has been reaffirmed by the church leaders in our day. Mm, not for very long, this book was published in 1967, so just a few short years later, that policy would be changed. In answering the letter of a prominent Mormon critical of the church policy in this matter, the first presidency of the LDS Church a few years ago wrote as follows. We might make this initial remark. The social side of the restored gospel is only an incident of it. It is not the end thereof. The basic element of your ideas and concepts seems to be that all God's children stand in equal positions before him in all things. Your knowledge of the gospel will indicate to you that this is contrary to the very fundamentals of God's dealing with Israel dating from the time of his promise to Abraham regarding Abraham's seed and their position 
vis-a-vis -vis with God himself. Indeed, some of God's children were assigned to superior positions before the world was formed. We are aware that some higher critics do not accept this, but the church does. Your position seems to lose sight of the revelations of the Lord touching the pre-existence of our spirits, the rebellion in heaven, and the doctrine that our birth into this life and the advantages under which we may be born have a relationship in the life heretofore. From the days of the prophet Joseph, even until now, it has been the doctrine of the church never questioned by any of the church leaders that the are not entitled to the full blessings of the gospel. Furthermore, your ideas, as we understand them, appear to contemplate the intermarriage of the and white races, a concept which has heretofore been most repugnant to most normal-minded people from the ancient patriarchs until now. God's rule for Israel, his chosen people, has been endogamous. Modern Israel has been similarly directed. We are not unmindful of the fact that there is a growing tendency, particularly among some educators, as it manifests itself in this area toward the breaking down of race barriers in the matter of intermarriage between whites and blacks, but it does not have the sanction of the church and is contrary to church doctrine. And this next paragraph here, as the latest edition of this book goes to press, September 1963, it might be of help to the reader to note that, amid the greatly increasing public interest in this subject, LDS leaders have steadfastly reiterated this church doctrine. So oftentimes I get comments from Mormons claiming that the church has never taught this. This idea that black people were less valiant in the pre-existence is I mean, it's repugnant to most people. Most people see that and recoil. They go, ooh, I don't like that. I don't agree with that. That makes me feel icky. And a lot of Mormons who really aren't familiar with the history of the church, who aren't familiar with the things the church has done, because a lot of this has been whitewashed, they don't realize that. They don't realize that the church taught this. And when I bring it up in books like Mormon Doctrine, where Apostle Bruce R. McConkie said it, Books like The Doctrines of Salvation by Prophet Joseph Fielding Smith, he said the same thing. Um, books like this one that was not written by an apostle, but also says the same thing. And now here you have it from the first presidency of the church. I'm not exactly sure when this, uh, when this came out. He said it was a few years ago, which if the book was published in 1960 originally, it would have been a few years before that. But then he says that this book, was the re most recent version was published in 1963, and that the church leaders at that time were still reiterating this doctrine. Just a few years before the doctrine was changed, before they stopped teaching this and tried to wipe it away from the history so people wouldn't know about it. And here's the thing, Mormons who do know about this will usually say, yes, the leaders were wrong. It was wrong. Do you not get the sense from reading this book, from hearing this quote from the first presidency, from all of these things coming together, do you not get the sense that this was important? Books were written about it. If the leaders were wrong about this, if you see this, see what they're saying and say, that's not right. That is not from God, okay? We can both accept that. I also don't think it's right. I also don't think it's from God. What else were the leaders wrong about? These men claim to be God's mouthpiece upon the earth. One of the most important rules that you follow, one of the temple questions that you have to answer before you go through the temple is, do you follow the leaders? Do you follow the prophet? And if they were wrong about this, what else were they wrong about? How do we know? Sure, people will say, yeah, the church leaders are fallible, but the church is perfect. These are the people who created the church, the people who continue the church, the people who are making the rules, who are writing down doctrine, who are preaching to everybody because this church claims that it wants to be worldwide. So when these people say things, they're saying it to the whole world, you know, like the family, a proclamation to the world. They make a statement and put it out there for the whole world. Is this what God wants the world to hear? If it's not, why did he let them say it? We're also taught that if a prophet were ever to say things to the people or were, was gonna try to lead the people astray, that God would take him out. So why did God not take him out before they started saying these things, before they started publishing them? What else are they wrong about? When he says here that as of the latest edition of this book, the LDS leaders have steadfastly reiterated this church doctrine. What else will change in the future? Right now, the church is still steadfastly reiterating that it's a sin to be gay. Will that change? People can't change the color of their skin. Okay, eventually, I guess that caught on and they've realized that, oh no, yeah, like that's just how people are born. They weren't sinning in the pre-mortal life. 
What about people who are gay? It's just like that Book of Mormon musical song that I believe in 1978 God changed his mind about black people. What else is gonna change? When will it change? The church is constantly changing. It's amazing the amount of people that are totally fine with admitting that yes, the leaders got it wrong. The prophets were wrong. The apostles were wrong. But then are fully committed to being 100% true to what the leaders say today. Except as far as masks and vaccinations go. I will leave links to those videos in the description too. President Joseph Fielding Smith, outstanding LDS theologian who treated the subject in his book, The Way to Perfection, published nearly 30 years ago, has again emphasized in 1963 that the status of the has not changed. The gift of salvation is open to every human creature. Baptism and confirmation constitute the way to the celestial kingdom of God. This can be obtained by any human individual, white, black, or of any other hue on the condition of repentance. The church has never denied the a place in the celestial kingdom if he will repent and accept the gospel. The restriction in relation to the priesthood is another matter. It is not the authorities of the church who have placed a restriction upon him regarding the holding of the priesthood. It was not the prophet Joseph Smith nor Brigham Young. It was the Lord. This is not the big flex that they think it is. It wasn't our prophets that were racist. It was God. And President Henry D. Moyle observes that there is a difference between designation and discrimination. It is the Lord's priesthood, and he has the power to designate whom it shall be given, and that power of designation has never been given to man. Therefore, there can be no discrimination among men dealing with the power over which they have no right to designate. Similar statements have been made recently by President David O. McKay and several other leaders of the church, reaffirming this LDS doctrine and stressing the fact that, as President Smith says, no other church offers the so much. True LDS are pleased to see the gains greater civil rights and opportunities. An increasing number of correctly apprised of the LDS doctrine are appreciative of what the church offers them and are seeking and gaining baptism into the church. Here's the thing. He's not wrong that all these people have said all these things. That all of these church leaders have reiterated over and over again that black people can't have the priesthood because God says so because of something they did before they were born. It's not our fault. It's God. It's not us. It's a designation. We're not discriminating. It's God's designation for them as if that makes it okay. Blaming God for your racism doesn't make you not racist anymore. If I had seen and read this book as a Mormon, I feel like I would have had to ask myself the question, can this church really be true? 10 years after this book was published, God changed his mind. Was it really God that changed his mind? Because now we have Mormons claiming left and right that it was the prophets that were wrong because God isn't racist. Who which is it? Can this church be true? Can the prophets be true prophets if they can make mistakes that big? We've still got more of this book to go, but I'm gonna wrap it up here for today because I've been talking for a very long time. If you guys are, maybe not, maybe enjoying isn't the right word, but if you are getting something important out of this series, please share it. I'm not going to stop reading this book till we get through the whole thing because I think this is really important. I think this is important for people to know. I know that, you know, as the years go on and these videos stay up on YouTube, enough people will see them that it will matter. But right now, a lot of my subscribers are just not interested in seeing this. I understand that the subject matter is heavy. I understand that it's difficult to get through. I understand at times that it can be boring. I'm gonna keep going. But for those of you who are still sticking around and watching this, please share it. This right here is important information. This right here could change minds and it could change lives. And this isn't anti-Mormon propaganda. This is written by a member of the church. This is backed up with church leader quotes. It's full of them. If you're enjoying this series, please like, leave a comment letting me know that it's important to you and share it with anybody you're comfortable sharing it with. Thank you guys so much for being here. I really appreciate it. If you would like to support the channel, there are many different ways to do it. The simplest is just liking this video. The algorithm cares. The algorithm will show this video to more people if more people like and comment on it. You can also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I also have Patreon and other ways to support the channel linked in the description. And speaking of my patrons, let's take a minute to thank my patrons so much for supporting the channel. I really appreciate it. You guys are the best. Special thank you to Anthony Guthrie, at Kegar, Craig Call, Doug Davis, Mormonland, The Guiltiest Place on Earth, Jake Nunyabiz, Jason Wilkins, Melissa Jane, Tans, and the Exmo Candle Company for supporting at the Demon Tier on my Patreon. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!